Welcome to Marriage Heart to Heart. We're Tom and Elaine Waters with Restoration International, and we're looking forward to our time together with you today as we talk about more principles for the marriage. We hope you have your paper and pen with you as we are going to look at two special ways to develop respect in your marriage. Respect. It's a big word, isn't it? A very big word. And it's, it's a big lack in many, many homes today. It was in our home, and I think that that's one of the reasons why we had some of the problems we did when we first got married. And it's something we've seen in many marriages, the lack of respect. And it's another thing that we didn't really understand. Let's take them back to, well, two years into our marriage, and we were coming back from Wisconsin. Remember that day on the Illinois Tollway? Oh, yes. <laughs> we were coming back on the Illinois Tollway, and any of you that have ever been on that tollway, on a Sunday afternoon when it seemed like everyone was going the same place we were going, I was looking for a shortcut. A shortcut. What do you wives think about shortcuts? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've gotten all kind of responses, right? <laughs> well, when you started cutting across those lanes of traffic and you were in the far left lane because you have a, a, a determination to get where you're going. So the left lane is supposed to be the fast lane. That's where you were. Wasn't moving very fast that day. <laughs> we were, all the lanes were pretty much stopped and a little bit ago. But when you started working your way across those five lanes of traffic and heading for that exit, I turned to you and I said, honey, do you know where you're going? Now think about that, men, for a moment. How could a wife ask a husband a question like that? <laughs> do you know where you're going? And I know there are probably some ladies out there right now that uh, understand very well why my wife asked me that question. You've had your experiences with shortcuts. Well, there we were. I really didn't know where I was going, but I knew I was going home, and I wanted to get home as fast as I could. So I said to you, of course I know where I'm going. At that time in my experience, now I wasn't really lying to you because I was going home. But at that time in my experience, I certainly didn't want to admit to you that I didn't know where I was going on this shortcut. It was headed the right direction. It was going the right direction for sure. <laughs> well, as we drove for quite a while on this new exit, I suggested to you, honey, maybe we should stop at a gas station and find out where we are. Oh, friends, stopping at a gas station. <laughs> That's like an admission of defeat, isn't it? Here, I'm supposed to stop at a gas station because I don't know where I'm going. So fortunately, at that point, there were no gas stations. We were past the gas station, so we didn't have to stop. And I thought it was a good opportunity to ask my wife to get out the map because she's a great map reader. So I asked her to get out the map. And I got the map out, <laughs> and I started looking at the map for the area that we were in, in the greater Chicago area. And I could not, as hard as I tried, I could not find where we were on the map. I'd look at the streets we would pass, and they were not on the map. It was an old map, and this was obviously a new developing area. Ah, my chance uh -huh. to blame you. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you know, isn't it sad, and we can laugh about this now, it's not very funny if you're in this lack of respect presently, but we can look back over 20 years ago and we can laugh at this because we are always prone to want to cast blame. And so my wife can't find this road on the map. And so now I'm going to blame my wife. Well, I have to tell you, the Lord knows how to humble a man's pride. And that's what he did because as you recall, dear, that four lane road went down to a two lane road with a line down the middle, and then it went down to a, uh, just a blacktop road with no line down the middle, and it turned into a gravel road, and as we continued on, I hope it wasn't to your delight, <laughs> <laughs> but as we continued on, we came to the end of the road, and it was the end of my shortcut, and it was a fence and a cornfield this far and no farther, and I can assure you that even then, my pride was not so bad that I was going to run down that fence and go through that cornfield. So God began to open our eyes. You see, I wasn't respecting you. I wasn't respecting the fact 
that you were a great map reader. You were great with your natural directions. And the reason I didn't want to say anything to you is because I knew full well, if I said to you, I want to take this shortcut, you would have probably said, Honey, I think we better stick on the tollway. And I didn't want to stay on the tollway. I wanted to look for anything that would get me in the right direction and would move a little faster. Well, it wasn't just your problem. I mean, neither one of us really understood respect or that we didn't have respect. I mean, we respect each other to a certain degree, but the, the deep respect for mm -hmm. what's in the heart, we didn't really understand. And so while you were blaming me, I was <laughs> not respecting you either. And so I would respond with sarcasm. And then when we ended in the cornfield, I just wasn't gonna say anything. I mean, that's how I, I responded. This Cold War started, you know? Okay, here we are. He can figure it out from here. There's no love in that. Well, it was better than what could have been. <laughs> well, you I could have gone into the I told you so, and, you know, but I was thankful you didn't do that. Yeah, but I really didn't have respect in my heart for you. I should have respected the fact that your only desire was to get home earlier, and it's okay. It's a mistake. And so you could learn from that. And you just don't take shortcuts anymore unless you're confident <laughs> in them, right? <laughs> and we did learn from that. I learned from that. It was a, it was a mutual experience that we learned in. And um, I don't mind stopping at gas stations anymore to ask for directions, do I? No, and you don't even have to be asked to. Sometimes <laughs> you're just gonna pull in and say, honey, go find out where we are. You know, the lack of respect is a painful situation. And if you find yourself in that right now in your marriage, it's not laughable. We can laugh at it, partly because it was back there in those years, you know, 20 plus years ago. But part of the reason we can laugh at it now is because it's no longer a painful part of our experience. Our love is alive. We have respect for each other. And we just want to encourage you in that respect today, how that we can develop respect. You know, one of the, the things that I began to recognize is that often we husbands, and this is not a stereotype, but I tell you I've met a lot of men all over the world as we do seminars and as we counsel, a lot of times this characterizes men. Men, and this was me at this time in my experience, were often very slothful in showing our appreciation for the wife that God has given us and appreciating the things that she's done for us. Coupled with that slothfulness and lack of appreciation, we have very high expectations of what we expect from our wife and correspondingly very low expectations upon what we need to be doing ourselves. So there I was in our relationship together, husband and wife, you were supposed to be my Eve, right? Of course. This wonderful woman <laughs> that's going to be all the things that I need and do all the things for me. Never occurred to me, friends, that I should be anything like Adam. <laughs> it was that me focus showing up again. Those spurts of dominance would show themselves. If I couldn't get my way, if I couldn't get my wife to do what I wanted her to do, it's terrible to say this, but... I can only say it because we're past that, aren't we, honey, in our marriage? <laughs> but it was terrible. If I couldn't get her to do my way, I was so selfish that I would remind her of all things, a Bible text. Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Now, I left off. As unto the Lord. That's right. Now, of course, you can see why I left that off because I wasn't talking about it in the context of true submission. I was wanting her to submit herself. Now, I also knew what it said just a few verses down there in Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wife even as Christ loved the church and did what? Gave, Gave himself. I wasn't in that focus. I was in the selfish me focus. I wanted you to do what I wanted you to do for me now. And that wasn't love. That wasn't true respect. It was an overbearing dominance. And I wasn't expressing to you that love. Now I understand 
that as I love you and give myself to you the way Christ gives himself to us as a people, it makes it much more beautiful and much easier for you to submit yourself as unto the Lord. That's right. You know, the, the lack of respect. Now, we first had to identify where our weakness was, and this is very important. When you find yourselves, rather than just going through one hurt after another hurt after another hurt, identify what is lacking, where the problem is. We identified we really don't respect each other the way we should. And so once we identified it, then we looked it up. What does it mean to really respect? Because so often we know words, we hear words, and we interpret them in a very superficial level. That's right. So we went back, remember when we went back and looked up the word? Mm -hmm. We want to define that word for you today by Mr. Webster, and then we're going to define that word by 1 Corinthians 13. If I respect you, as I develop that respect, means I will regard you with pleasure. We always put these in the first person. Mm -hmm. What I will do. I will regard you with pleasure. I will look favorably upon you. That would have changed the whole atmosphere in the car that day on the Illinois That's tollway right. or on the exit, the shortcut, if I would have <laughs> developed that respect for you. Yes, because you would have been not just thinking about how it was affecting you. That's right. But how your response could affect me. Let's look at it in 1 Corinthians 13. This is love manifested through respect. True respect is kind. It's a pretty simple word. But how many people really express kindness to the one that they've given their life to? Really express kindness. True respect seeketh not her own. It's not there in the, the me focus. And true respect suffers long. There's that patience coming back again. That's what we will experience if we are developing true respect in marriage. So then, it's not a dominance in the marriage of one or the other. It's not you are the dominant one or I am the dominant one, and that's what causes conflict. Mm. It's that we are blending with each other heart to heart. Yes. You know, the me focus is always characterized, and I, I like to use kind of, I say a barometer, okay? If I am responding to you in a, a demanding way or an inconsiderate way, if I'm being over dominant or controlling, that's not real respect. And I know then if that's happening, that I'm not experiencing that real love of Christ that comes and that will give me respect. That's a barometer to me that I'm working in the me focus. You know, and if we, if we as a people would just take a few moments sometimes to pause and think about where we're headed, we recognize that we are not respecting the other person. The me focus is always characterized by selfish over-dominance controlling, whereas the us focus is always considerate of the other person. How will this affect the other person? How will this affect us in our marriage together? And so, that is what we need to do when we develop respect. It changes us from the me focus to the us focus. So we're going to take a break now, and when we come back, we're going to be talking about two simple ways that we can develop respect in our marriage. There are many how-to books available, but there's one that's free and perfect for every couple. How you can build a better marriage. Bible-based matrimonial advice is given in a light-hearted, easy-to-read manner for those contemplating marriage, newlyweds, couples in their golden years, and everyone in between. Simply call or write for your free copy of this amazing little booklet, a handy little tool to help build a better marriage. Welcome back. We've been talking about developing respect in our marriage. And we want to look at two simple ways. Now, there are very, a lot more ways, many more ways that we can begin to develop respect in the marriage. But we want to just give you two simple things that you can begin to do today to make your marriage heart to heart. The first one is cultivate a spirit of kindness. That word cultivate is an important word there. 
That means we need to be doing something, you know. We, we've got a beautiful garden at home, and if we don't cultivate that garden, what happens? It gets weedy. <laughs> So it, takes out. Some, it takes some work, doesn't it? So we need to cultivate the spirit of kindness. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted. I remember the day we were driving down the road together in Montana after they had returned the speed limit to reasonable and prudent. Now, I know that there would be a lot of men out there that would really like the speed limit in Montana in those days. R and P. And when that 55 mile an hour speed limit came in years ago, that federally governed speed limit, Montana was not happy with that. And they said that they were going to take that away if that ever changed and it would go right back to reasonable and prudent. And many of us rejoiced the day that that speed limit returned because when you entered Montana, it said, Welcome to Montana. Speed limit. Reasonable and prudent. Drive according to conditions. Oh, that was wonderful. To some people, that meant unlimited speed. Now, it didn't mean that to me, did it, dear? No. But I remember one day as we were driving to Kalispell, uh, we were driving along, and I thought I was driving what was a very reasonable and prudent speed for the conditions of the road and the beautiful day that we were driving. But that wasn't necessarily how you felt. Well, I felt it was a, a little bit unreasonable and not too prudent. <laughs> more too fast for my comfort and so I turned to you and I said honey would you please slow down now that was a very simple request but now think about it men at that moment maybe I should ask the ladies too at that moment how do you think I responded because now I'm driving and I'm driving what I think is very reasonable and prudent well I can tell you that the very first thought that came through my mind and you can be sure that quite often those first thoughts are not the best thoughts. But the very first thought that came through my mind was, who's driving? <laughs> or, just have faith. Yeah. Hang on. Pray. <laughs> but those, you know, I recognize, and this is, this is some good news, and that is James 1.19 is a beautiful verse that I knew for many, many years before I made it practical in my experience. And it says, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Now, I realized instantly that the Spirit was calling to me. Because who's driving was not the response that God wanted me to give back to you. It was to pause a moment and listen to what saith my Lord concerning the matter. And I did that. And so my response back to you was, a thought that the Lord gave me in my mind. And that was, when I'm with you, I'm going to drive in a way that's comfortable for you so that you can enjoy the time with me. When I'm alone, I can drive a speed that the Lord and I are comfortable driving together. That was divine inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> Better than who's driving. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, it, it communicated a message that you were doing it for me and that you were willing to, to cultivate that kindness for me. Mm -hmm. Not just when I was with you and in the car going along with you, but that when I'm at home, I knew that you would be under the Lord's direction instead of under your own direction. Mm -hmm. That gave me a lot of peace because I could be just as nervous at home with you driving without me <laughs> as I would be if I was in the car. So I knew that God was working in your heart and that you did that out of a desire to show me respect, that you respected me and you wanted to demonstrate that respect through this kindness. Yeah, and it's nice that, that that's a simple way that I was able to cultivate some kindness. You know, true manliness, true godliness, true leadership in a man is not being over dominant. It is serving those best who we love most. It's really looking to serve rather than to control. I have to tell you though, men, unfortunately, well, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, there's no more reasonable and prudent in Montana. Too many people abused that R&P. <laughs> so we're back to regular speed limits there, but uh, 
that was a nice opportunity to cultivate a little bit of kindness. Yes, and really show me that you respected me. It's interesting that more people are kinder to a stranger than they are to the, the one they're married to. Mm. Many couples, they speak so nicely to a stranger, so nicely to their animals, so nicely to an acquaintance, somebody at church, oh, they're happy to see them. But in their own home, they speak with disrespect. And the influence of that in the home is deadly. Hmm. Not only to the marriage, but the influence it has on the children. And we wonder why our young people, by the youth today, why there's no respect for leadership and authority. is because it's not being learned and seen and, and exemplified in the home. That's right. Well, let's talk about the second area. Okay, so first we have cultivate kindness to develop respect. The second area is to be determined never to injure the other person with our attitudes, with our words, and even with our passions. There's that word determined again. That's an action word. We need to be determined. There needs to be a commitment there to be determined never to injure the other person. You know, Proverbs 15, 1 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath. That's a pretty simple formula, but it's not always easy to do, is it? Not at all. But I like these words, be determined never to injure the other person, because it shows a choice mm. on my part. I have to make that choice to be determined, and that can only be done as I'm willing to let Christ work in my heart. I remember that day that we met with a group of people out in Glacier Park. You remember that morning we got there? Mm. And we had your father with us. He had just had a stroke. Uh, a little bit before that and anyway we went out there and we were sitting down singing with the group of people in that outdoor pavilion and we, as we were sitting there I noticed that your father you know was kind of tucking himself in like he was cold and remember me turning yeah, to cool. you <laughs> it was cool the sun hadn't come over the mountain yet and I turned to you and I said honey would you please bring dad's sweater for him out of the car I was happy to do it Oh yes, you've always been good to do things like that and you know, for me or for your father and it was in your heart and so you went back to the car and came back and not only did you bring it to your father, but you went the extra step and that was to help your father put the sweater on. And I turned over, I was watching you help your dad and as I looked at what happened, I spoke these words, nothing like having your son make a mess of things. Hmm. I think I had put the the sleeve over his head <laughs> instead of the, the right, it looked pretty funny. Yeah, whatever it was, he was all twisted up in the sweater. And, and as I spoke those words, even hearing myself say them, I felt bad mm. because I had injured you by my words. I had belittled you and embarrassed you, not only to you, but to your own father. I mean, that was degrading to him. This is his son who's willingly trying to help him. And then I come off with something like that. It was, I was shocked that I even said it. I, I know we have to think before we speak, but it wasn't in my heart. I wasn't thinking those mm -hmm. kind of thoughts about you. It just came so spontaneously. And it was, you know, hearing myself say it. The Spirit brought conviction to my heart. That's how God works, because He loves us. Amen. And He wants our marriages to truly be heart to heart. He wants us to respect each other. And I said, oh, I'm sorry I said that. It's, it's not right. Please forgive me. And I said it to you and to your father. It had been so long since you had said something like that that was cutting and, and sarcastic that it, it, didn't, it didn't even affect me the way that it normally would have. It had been so long, and I was thankful for that because that's the other thing I think our listeners, the viewers, need to understand is when we are in this situation, we don't have to respond the old way. We can, we can allow Christ to make that difference, and I did not respond in the same spirit that you spoke to me, and it was restored. The, ex the relationship between us was restored immediately, but, you know, I think it's important Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. That's a pretty potent statement. And it's, that word death is, is actually, that is the word death. I, I looked it up as I was studying this one day. 
And we need to realize that we can set someone on a course that's, that's heartbreaking and, and destructive, or we can speak words that are a savor of life unto life. That's right. And so we have to be determined not to injure the other person, not just by our words, but even our reactions, that's right. our actions, our expressions, our passions be that's determined. Right. So let's bring a personal challenge to the people. The same one we've brought to ourselves. Exactly, exactly. If you want to cultivate a marriage that's heart to heart, begin to cultivate kindness today. Before you go to bed tonight, before you close this day, pray and think of at least one way that you can demonstrate kindness to the one that you love. Only one way? Well, at least one way if they're getting started. Okay. So we start where we are and we build on it, right? Yes. So if we haven't done anything, then we start with one or two. And then if we've been doing it, add to it because that's how we begin to cultivate kindness and build respect in the marriage. The second area we want to challenge you with is to be determined never to injure your spouse by your words, by your actions, your reactions, your passions. That's a big order. And it can't be done without Christ. Well, maybe this is a good time to make a commitment in prayer. Do you want to lead us in prayer, honey? Sure. Father, we are grateful for what you want to do in our hearts and in our homes and our marriages. Amen. Lord, we just pray that you would put it in us to cultivate kindness and to be determined never to injure our spouse. I pray that we would develop the proper respect and that we can truly have a marriage that is heart to heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. A marriage that's heart to heart. Yes. And we hope we'll see you next time as we talk about cultivating restraint. It goes hand in hand with developing respect. And we know that you want to have a marriage heart to heart. And Jesus can make that possible.